been doing a series on harvesting, and we're talking about harvesting souls. In the last couple of weeks, I've shared with you some amazing stuff, some really interesting stuff, and uh, some of you that weren't here, you can see us on YouTube or Facebook Live, and we want to welcome all our Facebook Live viewers, uh, all one of you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it was funny, I, I uh, was saying, yeah, there wasn't very many people on Facebook Live, but the person said, but our whole family was watching, that was four of us. So you don't know how many people are on the other end of that computer. And, uh, you know, so we welcome all those with us tonight. And we are talking about harvesting souls for the kingdom of God. That's our whole theme in October is harvesting. And uh, uh, so bear with me, some of you that haven't been here for the last couple of weeks. I might have to just bring you up to date just a little bit. But uh, two weeks ago, the very first uh, message we talked about in the Luke chapter 10, verse 2, he calls 70 together, and he sends them out, and he says this, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech or pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that our hearts are open. We just come against any barriers that hinder us from receiving from you tonight. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are speaking to us in Jesus' name. Now, uh, let me ask you something about this first. It's all it's not on the screen. It, uh, it will be there, maybe. Uh, the, it's, it's white. That's a good sign. Jesus said this, okay, that you have to listen very carefully because you don't have it on the screen yet. It says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into, and I'll, uh, you know, use some emphasis, his harvest. So let me ask you something. Whose harvest is it? It's his harvest. It's God's harvest, isn't it? Now, we uh, talked about some problems that uh, in the first message, what we think, we think that nobody wants to talk about God, nobody wants to talk about these things, and, and how that's not even true, and uh, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit more tonight, but uh, it's God's harvest. And I have to ask you this, do you think that God knows when His harvest is ready? Do you, absolutely, yes. So do you think God would say, I want you to go out into the harvest if it wasn't ready? No. The answer is no. He, the harvest is ready. All we have to do is take a look around and we find people that are waiting to be brought into the kingdom of God. And so that was the first uh, message was based on chapter, uh, Luke chapter 2, sorry, 10, uh, verse 2. And one of the most amazing things about this passage, and uh, some of you that weren't here, you can go study it when you get home. But uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse uh, 17, the 70 come back and they were full of joy. Now, you're in a Pentecostal church tonight, so say full of joy. Full of joy. Now, you're in a real charismatic Pentecostal church tonight, say so, say full of joy. Thank you. Now, they were full of joy. And they were full of joy when they came back from going out into the harvest. And, uh, and, and they were like, God, I mean, Jesus. And they said, even the demons were subject to us in your name. Now, here's the little part that I had never seen before. Jesus says, I was watching Satan fall like lightning. I always thought that he was talking about like before when Satan got kicked out of heaven. Uh-uh. That's not what he, he was responding to what the people said. They said, we were, we were out there. They were, the, even the demons were subject to your name. And Jesus says, I was watching. We said, it's like going to a hockey game. And uh, the, the, your, your child comes back and says, Dad, Dad, I scored a goal. Did you see me score a goal? Yes. I was watching. That's exactly what it means there. It doesn't mean any the thing previous. It means right here, right now. I was watching Satan fall like lightning when you went out into the harvest. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Now, he's watching. And the only time in the Bible where it says Satan falls like lightning or falls fast is when believers go out into the harvest. If you want to see Satan fall like lightning, it's time to get out of these four walls and get into the harvest. Now, I don't know if you've ever uh, witnessed a farmer when that last uh, uh, 
crop, piece of crop is combined. We've got Austin here tonight. I found out he's got 5,000 acres. So, uh, well, his dad owns, has 5,000 acres and Austin has some of it. And so they're not quite finished yet, but I got another farmer in Melford that last Saturday, they were finished. And I'll tell you, there is a relief, isn't there? At the end, because if you remember last year, this time we had snow. Some people had their crops out over the winter time and different things like that. There is a relief that says, yes, it is in. All right? And they're full of joy. They're full of joy when the harvest is brought in. They're full of joy. In fact, in Old Testament times, they used to have a party. And they'd call all their friends and neighbors for a party. So also we're expecting a call for a party when that last 100 acres is brought, 120 acres is brought in. All right? Uh, I'll, I'll get that call and we'll have a party. And, uh, and so Jesus answered when they said, even the demons are subject. He says, I know. I was watching. I saw. The very moment you went out and were witnessing or, or being my witnesses or going out to the harvest, I saw Satan fall like lightning. If you want to see Satan fall, then you need to become a harvester. You need to become a harvester. Then we talked about uh, last week about bearing fruit in John chapter 15. And uh, I, I showed you in John chapter 15, verse 2, it says this, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear forth more fruit. Now, this is a really bad translation, yet it's one of the best translations. The NIV says cuts away, which is really horrible. If you look, and I had, after last week's message, I actually had some people that had study Bibles, and they said, Kevin, it was right here all along. In fact, uh, Wes, he said, I have it circled. And the, the, the word for uh, he takes away is the little word, it's A-I-R-O, A-I-R-O, -A -I, I can't remember how to say it. And it literally means to lift up, to lift up. Now think about a vine and the branching of tomatoes and you want the, the branch to grow tomatoes, what do you do? You lift it up. If you have peas, which are a vine, what do you do? You lift it up. If you have grapes, you lift it up. And, and yet we've got some really bad theology because it says every branch that is in me, and later on it says any branch that's not in me, it's, it's uh, taken away. But every branch that is in me that does not bear fruit, what does Jesus do? He lifts you up. Go back and study it. You'll find it. If you have a study Bible, it's right there. Uh, he lifts up. So it's not cuts off, doesn't take away. And the word prunes means to clean. And then in verse 3, he says to his disciples, but you're already clean. Did you know the word prune and clean in verse 2 and verse 3 are related words? They mean they're almost, they come from the same word. They mean clean. You are already pruned. You are already clean. You are already lifted up so that you can bear much fruit. It's already done. You're already there. All right? And uh, because of this mistranslation, we get some really bad theology. Jesus isn't out to take you away or cut you off or uh, when you're not, uh, or sort of when you're in him, but you're not bearing fruit. How many know that we all go through bad times in our lives? Uh, we were talking this morning and, uh, you know, we had some new people in our church this morning and, and I said, you know what? If you come to church thinking that we're good, we're all just messed up. In the flesh, we're all messed up. This person uh, went home and phoned her, her uh, uh, stepsister in Regina and said, Guess what? I went to church this morning and they're all messed up. Not just our family. And I was just like, uh, I was talking this afternoon to the lady. And it was just awesome. You know, we none of us are perfect in our flesh. I mean, your spirit is absolutely perfect because Christ is in you, so we can say we are perfect. But your flesh, uh, our, our flesh, is, and what does Jesus do? He comes and lifts us up. Jesus is not in the business of cutting off, but in lifting up. Your salvation is secure because he's not cutting you off. He's lifting you up when you're in Christ, all right? And your salvation is secure because you're not the source of your salvation. Now, if I can be brutally honest today, when I used to think about going out into the harvest, to bring souls into the kingdom of heaven, it made me uneasy, uncomfortable, and even a little bit fearful. Anybody ever been there? Thank you for those three honest, four honest hands, all right? It was, it was uneasy, uncomfortable, and fearful because I thought the way we were to go out 
was to find total strangers, begin sharing the gospel with them, you know, go to malls, find random people at the food court, go door to door, take signs on the streets and be on the corners and different things like that. I thought that's what everybody was supposed to do. Now, I'm not opposed to that. If you're one of those people that are standing on the street corners, God bless you. You won't find me there, all right? Uh, I will. I'll probably go by and wave at you and say, God bless you, and walk on there by the other side, maybe. I know I won't do that, but I'll, that's, that's not me. I found something better, uh, and I'm not opposed to that. There are some men and women who are tremendously used by God in those situations. Absolutely. People, there are people called to that. But in my circles that I grew up in, or I went to Bible college in, and I've, I've hung out in, there was this expectation that everybody ought to be harvesting this way. I mean, when I went to Bible college, they had us going out in Saskatoon door to door. You know, we're doing ministry. And uh, I, I was fearful. I thought, what if they thought I'm the Mormons? You know, I made sure not to wear my white shirt that day. I don't want to be mixed up with that. You know, I don't want them to get, maybe they think I'm the JWs. And you know and I know that we've gone up to, or they, we see these people walking down our streets, all right? They got white shirts on, and we go into the back of the house, and they go, knock, 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 and we prep the tendons, but he's home. Am I the only one that's done that? No. <laughs> no yeah. yeah, I'm the only one that's done that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, nobody's home. Until your kids go, somebody's at the door. Shh, quick, don't tell them. Don't, don't be loud. Quiet, quiet. Don't let anybody know they're anywhere home. And then or your other kid goes, and they open the door. Hello. With white shirts here. Oh, okay, come on in, right? <laughs> I did not like that. I was uncomfortable going door to door. And uh, I've been in circles where students gather around after going to witness, out to witness, and they come back. You know, well, here's uh, there's some circles that they, I forget what it's called, and, and I'm not opposed to this. If God's called you to this, I'm not opposed to this. It's just not me. But they'll gather in prayer. And they'll say, okay, Lord, uh, give me a vision of somebody I'm supposed to go out to and talk to today. And they'll say, okay, I've got this person. Uh, it's a man. It's, he's going to be wearing a red shirt. And he's going to have glasses. And so they go out and they find this guy that's got red shirt and glasses. And then they, they begin witnessing to this person. I'm not opposed to that. But many times, and I've been part of this, and I've heard of this, uh, they come back from going out to witness and Christians, think about this, Christians begin to brag how they got kicked out of malls, they have got kicked out of buses, they have got kicked out of restaurants and other venues for witnessing to everyone who walked by, and they call this being persecuted. Oh, I got kicked out. And they're happy about it. They're happy about it. Now, maybe that's, maybe that's where you've been as well. Uh, and, and I know one uh, Bible college in California where malls and restaurants and other venues have actually called the Bible college and asked them not to send any students there. Don't come to our doors anymore. I think that's a really horrible witness. I think that's really horrible to brag about that we got kicked out of the mall for, for being a witness. I'm going to share with you why. See, this has always been uncomfortable and troubling for me. And we as Christians, we are vocally proud and pride ourselves in offending others. Offending others. We are proud that we became a nuisance or an annoyance to a business or a mall and we got kicked out of that business or a mall for being a nuisance or annoyance and we brag about, ah, oh, I was at this mall and I got kicked out, praise the Lord for sharing about Jesus. I want to tell you, we're going to see here that this doesn't even make logical sense. The question is, did Jesus offend people? The answer is yes. But who are the people that were offended by Jesus? And who are the people who were attracted to Jesus? And all through the Gospels, even in the epistles, you will find that the religious were offended by Jesus and the heathen sinners were actually attracted to Jesus. Amen. But we've got that all backwards now. We go out into this world 
and were offensive to sinners. Jesus wasn't. He, in fact, uh, the religious said to his disciples, he said, how come Jesus sits with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors? And Jesus said, I'm here for the sick. And somehow by the thousands, these people were attracted to Jesus and it was the religious who were offended. And yet we, as Christians today, brag about when sinners are offended by us. And I think that's, that's wrong. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says this. Solomon writes, Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them on your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. You see that? God and man. He says kindness and truth. Don't let them leave you. Bind them on your neck. Everywhere you go, be full of kindness. And you will find favor. Say favor. 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 How many know that we're favored? Yes. Favor with God and man. Kindness ought to overflow from us. And we ought to have a good reputation. How many know the Bible college I was talking about does not have a good re reputation in some of those malls and businesses that they've been asked not to come back to? They don't have a good reputation. In Luke chapter 2, verses 52, it's talking about Jesus. And it said this, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor. Say favor. favor. Now, say it like you're in my church, not your church. Favor, favor. with God and man. Amen. Jesus had favor with God and men. Jesus offended people, yes. But you cannot find where Jesus went out of his way to offend non-believers. He never went out of his way to offend non-believers. Jesus had favor with God and with men. And now quite possibly my favorite verse in the whole Bible, if, if I die pretty soon and you attend my funeral, make sure this verse is at my, I've said this about other verses too, but make sure this is at it, okay? Romans chapter 2, verse 4, says this, and it's asking a question. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and his patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Amen. Yeah. The kind, that word kindness is the word charis. We also get the word grace from that word. It is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance, not the hammer. <laughs> Kindness that leads people to repentance. Kindness is the key to favor. Kindness uh, of God that leads men to repentance or faith in Christ. And so tonight I want to show you a better way, and I entitled this Effortless Fruit. Effortless Fruit. Uh, and we're, we're talking about bringing souls into the kingdom. A better way of your life producing a harvest. And it's a harvest that is produced naturally from your life, because it's natural. <laughs> How do you know that things that come natural to you are easy? They're easy. Sometimes you have to work on things. You know, I'm not, I wasn't always a public speaker. I shared with you a few weeks ago my first Father's Day message, and that was really, uh, <laughs> that went downhill quick, right? Uh, and, and, and so you, you work on that. But now then things come easy and it becomes effortless. And while we are talking about harvesting souls for the kingdom of heaven, or what Jesus calls being born again, because we're talking about birth tonight, we're, talking, we're celebrating the birth of Elijah, the, the physical birth. The mess, this message is actually inspired by Elijah, his natural birth of a new life. And part of it is because I preach in Melbourne in the mornings and in Saskatoon at night, and I didn't want, want to make two messages, all right? <laughs> so, but this message was inspired by Elijah. And uh, so we're talking about harvesting souls, and today I have the privilege of celebrating the birth of my nephew, 
Elijah. And tonight we dedicated this little, this little boy to Jesus all the days of his life, smiling. And uh, we know that God has a plan for this little boy. God has abundant blessing and favor for Elijah. God's plan for Elijah is to have abundant life. And do you know what wasn't shared? I, like, you, you look at my dad. You, you know, 10 years ago, he had a brain lead on his brain stem, and they gave him two and a half hours to live. It was in the middle of the night. They phoned us in the hospital, and Kendall and I were there. And they said, your dad is going. Should we put him on a, 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 a breathing machine? Uh, and uh, we said yes, because my brother's coming tomorrow, because dad had been squeezing our hand with one hand. And if my brother could just squeeze his hand, then we'd take him off life support and just let him go. But uh, it turned out later, he wasn't actually dying. <coughs> he was snoring, I mean sleep apnea. <laughs> he had sleep apnea and his heart had stopped. But they told us two and a half hours and he's gonna be gone. Then they told us the next day that while well, he's still alive, he's gonna get pneumonia, then he's gonna die. Uh, then they said on the third day, they said, uh, we don't know how good he's gonna get. We have no idea. And 10 years later, when he went to his doctor last week, the doctor, he said, doctor, you were there. And the, his doctor, the Christian says, wasn't me. It was all God, because I did nothing. Now, uh, uh, dad is, uh, even met Jesus and looked over his shoulder and saw Kendall and I praying and Jesus gives him the option to stay or to go back and he says I guess I better go back and I'm so thankful he made that choice I'm not so sure he is but I am uh, so thankful that he's here today we've seen this miracle in his life we've seen the miracle of uh, Janan twice with no medication no treatment or anything be healed of cancer twice uh, uh, and then we've uh, uh, seen Elijah, how the first time his aorta was shrinking and they took him to Edmonton, they, they uh, stretched that out. And then the last surgery in Saskatoon, they were actually scraping away the scar tissue from the first surgery. And they said in this surgery, because at first they said he's going to, he's got three problems, he's got valve problems, he's got, I forget the other problem, and then he's got the shrinking or aorta. And, uh, and they said uh, he's going to have to have surgery at the worst when he's three or four. At the best, we'd like to do this when he's a teenager. And after the last surgery in Saskatoon, they said, we don't think he will ever require surgery for these other things because they're healed in Jesus' name. Yeah. So we believe that. And this message is inspired by this little boy and this natural life. Now, and God wants to, uh, Elijah to enjoy life. Now, natural birth is the byproduct of three main elements. This is where parental guidance is needed. I was saying to Marianne, I want people to think where I'm going, but I don't want to go over the top. Poor lady this morning, she laughed so hard, she almost beat her pants in church this morning when I mentioned this. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was great, <laughs> but there's uh, natural birth is the byproduct, or it occurs naturally, and it's three main elements. You have to have love, you have passion, and you have enjoyment. <laughs> if you have love, passion, and enjoyment between a husband and wife, what happens? Kids, right? <laughs> Kids happen. Uh, all right, love, passion, and pleasure. And, and uh, then all of a sudden the byproduct, yeah, I know you're getting blushy too, aren't you? Uh, the byproduct is children. And when those three elements are combined between a man and a woman, how do you know children naturally occur? You know, you can't stop it. Yeah, you know, they naturally occur. And, and I like this. I, I wrote this in my notes because some people, you know, might not agree, but no effort required, right? No effort required. Required. Well, I mean, there's some effort, but I mean, it's, you don't even think about it as effort. And, and the re thing is this. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. Some of you got it now, right? Here we go. Love, passion, enjoyment. God loves people. God is passionate about people. And God created this whole world for our enjoyment. Yes. And I'm telling you, when you go out as a harvester, it takes a little bit of faith. <laughs> it takes a little bit of faith. But if you have love, passion, and you are enjoying life, can I tell you this? People are going to follow you Amen. 
and people are going to get saved. When we love people the way God loves people, when we are passionate for people the way God is passionate for people, when we live a life filled with joy the way God intends us to live with joy and have that abundant life, when we as the children of God live this way, all of a sudden, bringing people into the kingdom of heaven becomes natural and effortless. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes into the upper room. The 120 are filled and effortlessly begin to speak in new tongues. Peter, who had earlier denied Christ three times, but no one could ever deny how much Peter really loved Jesus. He gets up and preaches. The first message to people after Jesus rose from this earth into the clouds. And that first tiny message in Acts chapter 2, you find 3,000 people get saved. Man, we think it's hard to get one person saved. 3,000. We don't even know how many people were there. But it's at the end of the chapter I want to focus on today. Because we're talking about effortless fruit. And effortless fruit for you might look different than somebody else. Every time I go to a conference, people talk to me about my dad. And how, man, he's just a soul winner. Everywhere, everywhere he goes, people just get saved. In fact, I had one pastor tell me, I can't remember where you guys were driving from, they were driving from one place to another, and he was with my dad. And all of a sudden, dad stops, turns the car around, and says, ah, there's somebody in this restaurant I got to go see. And the, the pastor's like, okay. And so they went back to this restaurant. Here was a person. They sat down with him, and like 15 minutes later, here this guy gives his life to the Lord. You know, these are, the, these are the stories he's not telling me. Somebody else is telling me about him. Do you know how scary that is to the rest of us? But here's dad. He's in his wheelchair. His wheelchair is his, is his pulpit. In the middle of Walmart. Walmart is his church. <laughs> Did you know that? He goes into Walmart. If you go to Walmart in Prince Albert and you see this guy in an electric wheelchair and he looks like him, that's my dad. All right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, dad's got people gathered around. And I, he phones me up one day. Kevin, what's a seek? Because I got this guy in Walmart and he's a seek. He sounds like us. <laughs> And next thing you know, he's got Bible studies out of his house for all these people. People are getting saved in Walmart and different things like that. But he hasn't been kicked out yet. Amen. Hasn't been kicked out yet. Here's the end of the chapter. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 47. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Guess what? This is a group of people that loved each other. Jesus says, they will know you're my disciples by your love, not for them, but for each other. They loved each other. Verse 45, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Can you imagine? I, I know some of you remember this. Some of you kids don't know this. But kids, there was a time in the 90s when we used to go to each other's houses to visit. <laughs> I mean, we used to go to um, people's houses and have a visit. In fact, people invited people over for a meal in the 90s. It's amazing what happened in the 90s. Right? Now, hey, you want to go to Tim Hortons? You want to go to McDonald's? You want to do, go out for supper? Let's, you know, we don't have this sharing together anymore. And what were they doing? They were having communion. They were breaking bread, having communion with each other. They were, and there, did you see this? They had meals with gladness. That means no liver was there. 
There were no turnips, there were no beets, and there were no yams. All right? <laughs> uh, and Brussels sprouts, they weren't even thought of yet. All right? They had gladness when they went to each other's house, and they ate and sincerity of heart. You know what? I really think that we as people in the church ought to start inviting people over to our houses. Yes, over. yeah. Amen. Amen. Because you go to a restaurant and you sit there for an hour and then you feel compelled to leave because you've been there for an hour and they a business and they got other people. People say, oh, if you're at Tim Hortons for an hour, you know they're going to start charging you rent or different things like this. But when we're at each other's homes and forget about the mess, you know why? Because houses get messy, and it's okay. Because if I come over to your house and it's perfect, I'm gonna feel bad about my house. I have three kids, and myself, and my wife can't pick up after all of us in two hours. Don't worry about it. And we think we have to have everything perfect in order to have somebody over. You should see me on Wednesdays clean my house. My wife is really grateful that Bible studies at my house because the house gets clean once a week, right? Man, I even clean the toilets for you guys. It's, I don't want you to see any of that stuff, right? They were glad. Verse 47. Praising God and having favor. Say favor. Favor. Now say it all together. Favor. Favor with all the people. Did you see they weren't going out offending people? They weren't purposely going out of their way to offend non-Christians. They had favor with people. And what's the last part of this verse? The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Favor. Daily. See, people love Jesus and they love one another. They were passionate about Jesus and they shared. They shared communion one with another. They had gladness or they were full of joy and they had favor. That word favor is the word graciousness and it means full of cheer. They were full of cheer. Christians, you ought to be the happiest people yes. in the world. And if you don't know David Meese's song, What's that song, Dars? Uh, you just have, oh, what's that? You can ra rattle Me, Shake Me. Just YouTube it. Rattle Me, Shake Me by David Meese. I know. Kids are like, who's David Meese? <laughs> yeah. Well, he was a really good musician. We ought to be full of joy. And daily people were being added to the kingdom. See, the early church loved each other. They were full of cheer and joy. And people came to Christ by the thousands. And it was effortless fruit. <coughs> effortless fruit. The early church proved what could happen when Christ becomes our life. In John chapter 15, and I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna talk about this more in a couple of weeks, I think, but he is the vine, we are the branches. And every branch that is in Christ will produce fruit. And I wanna leave you with this. Number one. The branches are not a source of life for the fruit. The source is the vine. You're not the vine, you're just the branch. Those nutrients that come through the vine flow out to the branches. But it's the branches that produce fruit. And the source of your source of life is not you, your source of life is Christ. The nutrients that you receive, you are receiving from Christ. And those nutrients are flowing into you, the branch, and you are just having fruit. You know, you've never seen a, you've never seen a, 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 a tree go like this. Oh, I'm trying to produce fruit. Ah! Looks like they're going to the bathroom, right? Oh, I'm trying to go to the fruit. They don't do that. It's effortless. Fruit is produced, and really, fruit is produced by the vine but it hangs on the branches. The life comes from the vine, and the same life that is in the vine flows through the branches. 
and it produces fruit. It's the life flowing through the vine that produces fruit. We just get to hold it. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. And as long as we are in Christ, we will produce natural fruit or produce fruit naturally. Number two, God gets the glory for the produce, not us. <laughs> My Father is glorified in John 15, uh, 8, Jesus says. Remember in Corinthians where there's an argument. I'm an apostle. I'm a Paul. I'm a who? Paul says, wait a minute. Apollo is seated. I watered. But God gets the, gets the glory. He's the one that gave the increase. He's the one that produced it. Number three, these things are spoken in John chapter 15. You'll find this. So that his joy may be in you and that your joy might be full. Do you know there is no greater joy than being with somebody when they say, I want to be a Jesus follower? There is no greater joy than being with that person at that moment and experiencing that over and over and over again. Let me finish with this. It would be nice to get every one of these people in the church. I believe in the church. I believe in meeting together, being taught, being edified, being built up, or being lifted up. As Jesus said, he, is the, he, he lifts us up. I believe in the church. But the most important thing is to get people into the kingdom of heaven. Last Thursday, I go to Melford every Thursday. And I get there by 9 o'clock to have coffee with the, the retired gentleman that I had coffee with every day for the last few years. <laughs> Here's this. I get there and they're meeting earlier. And so I just get there and they start leaving. And I'm left there. Oh, oh. Guy comes over. He says, hey, preacher man. Shakes my hand. How are you? Start talking. Then this other guy comes over. Now this guy is retired. He's kind of a goofball. Actually, he's kind of a nut. <laughs> I mean, just you would never think about this guy having a belief system in Christ. I mean, I literally saw this guy up against a window in Tim Hortons going like this. And I'm talking like this guy's 70 years old. I mean, he's old. That's my dad's age. Up against this window, right? I mean... He is such a goofball that there's guys in our group that have said, okay, you need to go sit over there or else I'm going to hit you. Like, he's such a goofball. He's, he's a nut. He's a nice nut, though. He's a good guy. He comes over. He starts talking to me. He starts talking to me about Scientology. And there's this show on TV, I forget what it's called, but how this woman came out of Scientology and he's talking about all this stuff and different things. And we, he says, this is just goofiness. I'm like, yeah, you're right. It is goofiness. And then we start talking about Jesus. This guy, who most people in Belfort would never think would darken the door of a church, has a belief system inside of him. He's looking for somebody to accept. Him. And my job in that situation, I mean, these things just naturally happen with me. I've told you before. And I curled in Melford, my skip's a Christian. He's curled there for over 25 years. And he came up to me and he said, Kevin, I have never seen people leave their tables, come over to your, our table, sit with you just to talk about church, God, or anything. People that don't go to church, unchurched. There are many, many people outside these four walls that have a belief system in Jesus Christ. I have a book, it's called They Like Jesus, but they don't like the church. And you know what, it's so true. Because the church oftentimes presents this Jesus that you better turn or you're gonna burn or you're gonna do, and, and they, this condemnation, judgmental, guilt-filled, shamed Jesus. And they don't want that Jesus. And you know what, I don't want that Jesus either. Do you know how that shocks people when they're sitting with me at with coffee and they say this? And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want that Jesus either. Let me share you, with you about the Jesus I do want. The one who's filled with love. He 
He's filled with grace. And here's this guy who has a belief system in Christ and the cross. And I just keep watering. I just keep nurturing. I just keep bringing life. Let me end this whole thing with one story of favor. It was on Tuesday this last week that I got up out of bed, went to Tim Hortons, got my French vanilla, 31 grams of sugar, and quarter coffee, still 31 grams of sugar. And I started going around the Mormon and I'm looking for different places to host Bible study because, you know, one of the things the Bible says is that we are supposed to have a good reputation. And a few weeks ago, I was looking at my house and I'm like, there's over 20 people at Bible study in my house. Look at all these cars lined up. Wait, right now I have four empty lots, but when those lots are got houses on them, my neighbors are not going to like me. Parking in there every Wednesday night. So I got up, I started looking, I saw these found venues and I'm phoning about these venues and they're talking about 40 bucks an hour. That's eight and we're there for, you know, two hours because, you know, you just can't have Bible study. You gotta eat and you gotta laugh after Bible study and you gotta have uh, enjoyment. So that's 80 bucks, $320 a month. I'm like, that's, a, that's too much. So two blocks over from my house in the Legends, there's a brand new day home for a uh, senior's day home. And I've been in there before and I saw a space that they had. I went into the office. I'm like, I know you don't know who I am, but I'd like to talk to somebody here. And I'm like, do you, do you know who I should talk to? And it says, well, it depends what you want. Well, I said, I'll tell you what I want and then you can tell me where to go. <laughs> and I said, I just like that. You can tell me where to go, right? And I, <laughs> I sh started sharing how we're doing Bible studies in Wormen. And I'm looking for a space to do Bible studies where we have parking. And her face began to shine like Matt Elbert when he sees a smart work. <laughs> and she said, I've got a place for you. I go over to this spot, and she says to me, first of all, I find out now that she's the owner. She says, I own this place. Then she said, would our residents be able to take part in the Bible study? I said, absolutely. In fact, I would like to make this a place where the community of Mormon would be able to come. We've got things in Saskatoon, church service on Sunday nights in Saskatoon. I love the community of Mormon, Martinsville, whatever. I'd like to grow this. She says, I'll give it to you for no charge. Wow. No charge. <clears throat> Nothing. Do you know what? I walk in favor. Amen. Do you know what? You walk in favor. Amen. You are favor. And since I've experienced grace, my eyes have been opened that people want to have these conversations. My best theological Discussions are with atheists. You know what? They like me. I said this a couple of weeks ago, and I hope this kind of speaks to your heart. When we go out to harvest, we need to stop trying to preach the Bible and start sharing how Christ has interacted in our life. I shared with you the story last week. The blind man, Jesus spits on the ground, puts mud in his eyes, tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. But in the story, the man never asked to be healed. In fact, there's an argument. Did he sin or did his parents sin? Jesus said, no, the glory of God is going to be revealed. The man goes to the temple and he's completely healed. And they said, who healed you? He says, I don't know. I don't even know the guy. And all he did is share how Christ intersected with his life. And people believed. How has Christ intersected with your life? When you just start sharing your story, your Jesus story, witnessing becomes easy. Because you're not trying to convince them of the Bible. You're just saying, this is what Jesus is.